Okay, so, um, well, first of all, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Makoto Yokohari, and uh, I'm, right, I'm now at the, um, uh, the University of Tokyo in Japan. Um, and um, actually, I'm teaching at the Urban Planning School in this university. Um, but, but before uh, coming to the uh, faculty right now, I used to teach at the Environmental Science School, and also uh, I was teaching at a um, uh, different university, which is called Tsukuba University, uh, located in the suburbs of Tokyo. And uh, well, uh, Bob and I, uh, we have been friends for, I don't know, something like more than 30 years or so. And um, I think I think 30 years, Makoto. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Well, you're right. Exactly. It's exactly 30 years because oh, it was back wow. in 1992 that I had a chance to be in Guelph. Yeah, and that's right. that, the, that the place we first met. And I still remember that uh, that was the time that you just came back from the uh, sabbatical in Lincoln University in New Zealand. Right, right. Yeah, so yeah, that, um, yep, that was the time that we first met. And since then, um, yeah, it has been very successful working together, uh, writing a lot of papers. And actually, uh, today's my talk. Uh, it does include uh, one of the works that we have been uh, doing together. And um, yeah, and we had a couple of times to invite uh, Bob to our university as a guest lecturer. Uh, the longest one was, um, I don't know, it's about 10, um, 15 years ago or something like that, that you were in Tokyo. Yeah, uh, for, yeah maybe 15 years ago, yeah. yeah 15 years yeah. ago or so. Yeah. For, a whole, for a whole semester, for, it was quite a long exactly. visit. Exactly, yeah. so that was yeah. for about three months or so that you yeah. were with us. And uh, you were living in a very uh, prestige uh, <laughs> yeah, in downtown right. Tokyo. <laughs> Yeah, I still remember that one day you came into the office and you said that, you know what I saw this morning? There were uh, Porsche, Ferrari, Lamborghini, <laughs> 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 all, you know, just the parks along the street. and <laughs> Three Lamborghinis right in front yeah, of my building, exactly. orange, yellow, and red. <laughs> <laughs> and also uh, that was a time that we, uh, we were hosting the uh, soccer World Cup in Tokyo. And right. one day, Bob didn't show up to the office, and we were wondering, so where's Bob? And actually, Bob, you got onto the subway, and you were trapped by, um, was it Ireland or some, um, some team from uh, um, Sweden. Sweden? Sweden. Oh, yeah, Sweden. And they were all wearing their hats with the horns. And, <laughs> <laughs> and Bob was trapped and drinking by those beer at hats. eight o'clock in the morning. And <laughs> yeah, and uh, those uh, Swedish guys said that. You come with us to the stadium. <laughs> 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 so that he couldn't come into the office. <laughs> so that kind of things were happening in the past. And uh, since then, um, yes, um, I had, um, was it only once that I had a chance to be in Texas? Um, maybe, you came to yeah. Texas once, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I was looking forward to coming again, but then this COVID yeah. and uh, I couldn't make it. But definitely, yeah, you know, since uh, once everything is over, then definitely I'll, I'll be, I'd love to come to uh, Texas again. Yeah. Before my it'd retirement. Be, it'd, be, it'd be great to have you come back, Makoto, yeah. That's yeah, sure. definitely. Uh, this has to be happened before my retirement because, yeah. um, you know, as you know, in Japan, we have a very sharp retirement age and it's coming soon. <laughs> I can't believe it, but that's what's going to be happening. <laughs> anyway, so that's a sort of a story that we, which uh, we have been uh, developing with Bob. And okay, so um, today I'm sorry, but uh, I'll be um, just giving your talk, uh, which I gave already at one of the conferences uh, last year, uh, the virtual conference, um, which was held in October. Um, and actually uh, this conference was uh, based in uh, Bangkok in Thailand, but of course uh, no one could come over to Bangkok. So everything was vertical, uh, virtual. But uh, the conference name was, as you can see here, it was a third Asia Pacific urban forestry meeting, uh, which includes not only the story of this uh, urban climate, but also it includes um, the stories of biodiversity and some other issues as well. Pretty comprehensive, uh, which has been organized by FAO, 
Um, you may have heard about it. It's a sort of a, a, a international uh, association. Um, the headquarter is located in Rome. And um, so, and some other uh, organization from Thailand has been involved as well. And um, I was uh, asked to organize one of the sessions during this conference uh, about uh, refer to urban climate. And uh, today's my talk will be, uh, was sort of a, a keynote speech of uh, our session. But at the same time, we did have a panel discussion. And on this occasion, uh, I um, um, was very fortunate to uh, invite Bob and also Marco and Neil as well. And then another uh, one of my friends from uh, Thailand, his name is Danai. Um, so uh, I organized uh, having a panel discussion with uh, four panelists. But of course, uh, this um, um, conference was held uh, early afternoon for Bangkok, uh, which is morning for Japan. And unfortunately, it was two o'clock in the morning in Texas. <laughs> So that uh, Bob was not able to, um, you know, actually attend um, this panel discussion, but he was kind, kind enough to uh, send us a video message, so that uh, which was very well received by the audience. But anyway, um, uh, we did have um, the panel discussion followed uh, by my talk, and also uh, Marco gave another talk as well. Uh, I don't know if Marco is now in here or not, but. Um, Anyway, um, there was Marco and also Neo. So, so um, for Marco and Neo, uh, my story today is a sort of uh, almost exactly the same with the one that I gave at the conference. So I'm sorry that I'll be talking the same story again. But anyway, um, that was the event that we had last year. Okay, so from here, I'd like to go into the key part of my story. Um, first of all, uh, I may have shown this um, uh, figure before, but uh, this figure has been illustrated by the uh, World Economic Forum uh, back in 2019, uh, just before the pandemic broke out. So that uh, this report was submitted in, uh, I think it was in September and October of uh, 2019. And this um, um, report uh, tells about um, those all different kinds of risks uh, which the world has to face with in the future. And uh, the horizontal axis is a likelihood, you know, how much that uh, risk will be happening. And the uh, vertical um, axis is the uh, impact of that uh, risk. And the interesting story is that uh, if you see this uh, um, figure, then you will be able to realize that the spread of uh, infected disease like COVID uh, has been listed not that serious. The likelihood is not that high, and the impact will be a little bit higher than the average, but then uh, they're thinking that, well, that's not that much dangerous. But on the other hand, uh, according to this report, uh, what they have been uh, nominating as a very serious guys are, as you can see, for example, failure of the climate change mitigation adaptation or extreme weather events or natural disasters, man-made environmental disasters and biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse and so on. And of course, uh, many of these um, serious ones are, um, you know, well, it's out of, um, most of them are out of the global climate change. So that uh, in short, we can say that even more serious risks than uh, this COVID uh, will be waiting us, uh, waiting us in the future, mainly caused by the global climate change. And that means that, well, uh, cities in the world need to mitigate uh, or adapt to the changes. So that uh, here I would like to say that, well, on one, on one hand, in terms of mitigation, of course, to make, uh, face with this problem, especially the cities in the world, should make it physically cooler. So of course, that's a sort of mitigation for cities in the world, make the cities uh, physically cooler. But on the other hand, it's not only you know, making physically cooler, but uh, the other thing that we have to think of is to make people feel cooler. So that um, I would say that mitigation will be making physically cooler, but on the other hand, adaptation is that make, make people feel cooler. 
And then uh, when you talk about this uh, making physically cooler, that means that I make gray fabrics cooler by using greens. The gray fabrics means that those uh, fabrics made out of uh, concrete or asphalt and so on, steel, glasses, you know, so uh, buildings and uh, roads and uh, um, some other infrastructures, those gray fabrics can make uh, cooler by using greens. But on the other hand, when it comes to make people feel cooler, I would say that there will be two different ways. Uh, the first one is to provide green spots um, um, so that um, to the people so that they will be able to enjoy physically cooler environment. You know, so that means that you'll be locating green spots in the city and just guide people into those places so that people can actually feel cooler. And the other is then make people feel uh, psychologically cooler by greens. So uh, the third one is not actually, you know, uh, making the temperature cooler, but simply making you know, the people feel psychologically feel cooler. So that um, to to um, face with these two uh, major problems, you know, one hand mitigation, the other the adaptation. Roughly speaking, I think there will be three approaches that you can take. Um, so here I'd like to start with the first one and then go to third, uh, second and third afterwards, okay? Now, when it comes to the first one, the make gray panels cooler by greens, well, there are, of course, many cities in the world are having certain potentials to make the city cooler by greens. Uh, for example, if you go to New York City, uh, you do have this, um, a huge patch of green in the center of the city, which is Center Park, of course, yes. And then uh, Bangkok, uh, I don't know if you ever had a chance to be in Bangkok, but right next to the city of Bangkok, uh, or I would say right now it's almost in the middle of the city, you have a huge patch of green, um, which is called Bangkok Chow. And uh, here, um, I hope you can see from this Google image that uh, here's a river flowing through Bangkok and this called uh, Chow Plan River. And uh, this Chow Plan River meanders here so that this area became to be almost like an island. And uh, I don't know how far you know about this, uh, uh, about the Thailand, but uh, when it comes to Thailand, the king is a superpower. You know, he is a, a person who decides the country. And when king says something, that's something that you definitely have to follow. And uh, many years ago, the, um, the former king, not the king right now, but the former king said that, well, why don't we see this green as a sort of a lung for Bangkok and we got to protect them. So that, well, of course, yes, it was king says that, uh, people would just follow and constantly uh, this um, a green patch was protected. And actually uh, most of this green patch is uh, farmland, uh, including some orchards and so on. Um, but anyway, uh, Bangkok has a big patch of green uh, right in the middle of the city as well. And of course, Tokyo too. Uh, when it comes to Tokyo, in the center of our city, we have this huge patch of green, which is Emperor Palace. Um, this used to be a castle uh, during the medieval years, but uh, since about 150 years ago, uh, this place uh, came to be. Um, uh, the Imperial Palace and has been protected as a huge patch of green in the middle of um, the city of Tokyo. But unfortunately, um, even though that uh, many of the cities in the world is uh, are having uh, greens in the city, but uh, the temperature is rising. And this shows how the temperature arose in Tokyo within these about 150 years or so. And as you see, uh, um, the rise was about 3.5 degrees Celsius within these 130 years or so. Um, but um, precisely talking, uh, the global warming uh, contributes only around 0 0.7 or 0 0.8. And the rest, which is about 2.7 or 2.8, is out of the uh, global heat island, uh, which I'll be referring to afterwards. But anyway, the temperature has been rising very sharply in the downtown. And um, if you compare the average temperature of Tokyo to other cities in Japan now, 
um, about 130 years ago, Tokyo was uh, almost like the temperature of Sendai today, which is about 500 kilometers north of Tokyo. So the temperature of Tokyo 130 years ago, 50 years ago, was almost equivalent to that, was, that of Sendai today. But then afterwards, uh, Tokyo started to travel south, like this way. Um, it came here, 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 here. And what you find today is that the Tokyo's temperature is almost equivalent to the temperature all the way down in Kyushu Island, which is uh, southwest of Tokyo, about 1,000 kilometers uh, southwest of Tokyo. So that means that within about 130 years, Tokyo has been traveling all the way down like this way. So that's a sort of idea how the average temperature of Tokyo has been changing within about 130 years. And once again, uh, it's not only the Imperial Palace that we have in downtown Tokyo as a big green patch, but there are several others as well, including uh, which is called Meiji Jingu. This is Meiji Shrine. It's a huge shrine, which is sitting in the center of Tokyo as well. And there has been a number of studies, you know, how these uh, big green patches are contributing uh, to reduce the uh, air temperature of the surrounding areas. And um, yes, well, this is one of the uh, studies which has been conducted by one of my friends. And he uh, um, did measure how the cool air from these uh, huge green patch will be um, approaching towards the uh, nearby neighborhood. But what he identified was that, as you can see from here, well, here uh, you have the, this green patch here is around here, okay? And this shows how the temperature changes. And the street here, you know, your street here is all the, uh, right, right down here, okay? And you can easily identify that even though the cool air is coming from this huge green patch, but it's, it's stopping here, you know, right at the edge of the street, it's stopping. Why? Because you have an array of tall buildings. So this tall buildings that became to be almost like a wall to stop the air, uh, cool air to uh, go beyond. So that even though that you do have these uh, huge green patches in some parts of the downtown Tokyo, but unfortunately, in many cases, these uh, areas of the high buildings are blocking those airs to flow through. And so consequently, only this tiny area will be able to enjoy the cool breeze from this, uh, this green patch. But once you go beyond the street, but no, no effect at all. So uh, if you want to uh, guide those cool breeze into the city, what you have to do is on one hand, you may want to have some sort of a wide open street, which goes from the green spots towards the, um, the, um, the urban uh, fabrics, or you may want to have a significant uh, green rooftops, which uh, will be another way that it will be guiding cool air into the green fabrics, uh, sorry, the gray fabrics. And uh, yes, there are a couple places that we are trying to do this in downtown Tokyo. And one of the examples is that uh, guiding cool breeze from Tokyo Bay into the city. Uh, as you may know, Tokyo is facing towards the ocean, uh, which is Tokyo Bay. And of course, uh, we do have cool breeze from the bay. So that uh, there has been some trials to guide those cool breeze from the bay towards the city center. And this is one of those examples. Uh, you have Tokyo Bay down here and a cool breeze uh, blowing from the south. And then this breeze will be guided into the city like this way, towards like this way, okay? And uh, which what we have been doing is that uh, we are trying to make the building lower around this um, uh, corridor. And also the big project that has been taken place about uh, 10, 20 years ago, was that we did have, we do have, oh, so once again, sorry, we do have a Tokyo Central Station here. Okay, it's uh, the, one of the biggest stations in downtown Tokyo. We have a central um, station. And we used to have a building 
uh, blocking this cool breeze like this in front of the station. But then this building was turned down about 10, 15 years ago. And what we have now, so it, it was like this way, you know, the building was blocking. So that cool air comes from this direction, but it was blocked here and couldn't go beyond. So that what we did was that uh, we turned down this building and now it's like this way. So that air will be flowing through the station and goes to where the Imperial Palace. And um, so that's one of the ways that we have been trying to do to guide, sorry, to, to guide the cool breeze from the ocean towards the city center. But then, but then, uh, this is a study which uh, we conducted uh, with Bob and I, and this story was about, conducted about 20 years ago or so. Uh, we have been measuring how the cool breeze from paddy fields, in this case, it was paddy fields, but how the cool breeze of paddy fields will be reaching into the urban fabric surrounding the paddy fields. And what we identified was that it was only about 150 meters from the edge of the paddy fields towards the, uh, towards the uh, urban fabric that that cool breeze will be reaching. And once you go beyond 150 meters or so, unfortunately, uh, the air will be warmed up again so that you won't be having any effect from the uh, green patch. So even though that you have a huge green patch and you are trying to guide those air into the urban fabrics, but the area where you will be able to enjoy that kind of green, uh, um, the cool air will be pretty much limited, uh, even though that the green patches are huge. So, well, if you want to have you know, the cooler city by greens, well, maybe this is the only way that you could do to make everywhere green, like just like a jungle. But of course, you know, uh, if you're living in certain cities like uh, some cities in China or Singapore or those cities might be able to do this. But um, I don't think this will be happening in the Tokyo and uh, rest of the world as well. So that um, even though that, yes, we know that the greens will be uh, reducing the air temperature and uh, that's going to be an important part of the city. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but um, well, um, if you really want to make the cities cooler by the green, but, but then uh, this is what you want to do, which is maybe it's not very difficult for most of the cities in the world. So in that sense, I have to say, make gray, gray fabric cooler by greens may not be easy uh, for most of the cities in the world, even though that they do have uh, huge patches of green in the city center. So number one, wonderful idea, but may not be that much applicable to uh, many cities in the world. So what we have to think of is to take this out to options and then uh, let's go into the second one, which is to provide green spots to people where they can enjoy physically cooler environment. Well, um, once again, the stir of Tokyo. Yes, of course, we do have parks and the public open spaces still on public lands. Of course, you know, we do have a lot of ordinary parks. But at the same time, uh, what is happening in downtown Tokyo these days is that uh, there are many green spots mostly developed by private sectors on lands owned by private sectors. So that these uh, greens that you see on the right are not public parks, but these are all the private lands uh, developed by private sectors, like uh, big uh, real estate companies or some headquarters of uh, the big companies in Japan. Yes, quite often they are having these patches of green in uh, at their uh, headquarter buildings or so. And um, the other example, which has been led by the private sector, is uh, uh, here I have one example which has been uh, um, conducted by Mitsubishi Real Estate. And this is called the Maloji Street Park. And this is um, uh, sort of a temporarily green uh, to make ordinary city, as you can see on your left hand, into a temporary park. As you see, um, they uh, put um, the real lawn on the street. And this um, um, event has been taking place every summer. Uh, and it's for about a month long or so. And so that um, 
this is another way that you will be able to provide cool spots uh, for workers and visitors in this uh, Manuji CBD, the central business district in Tokyo. So we do have this kind of trials as well. And this is uh, once again led by the private sectors. But then uh, what we have been doing uh, along with um, uh, uh, several major companies and also Mio has been one of the um, uh, members of this alliance, which is which we call Green Tokyo Alliance. What we have been doing uh, with this Green Tokyo Alliance is that not only providing these um, uh, greens by the private sectors, but also we were uh, trying to develop an application uh, for the, uh, the smartphones to guide people uh, properly to these greens. And it's a sort of application on the smartphone again, which shows that, so where you are now and where are the nearest green spots and what will be the best way to reach the green spot? And when I say the best way is to use a shade, um, which means that of, on one hand, um, uh, we do have, as you see, the uh, 3D, um, um, the data set of the downtown Tokyo about the built, uh, built um, sorry, the um, height of the buildings and where those buildings are. So we do have this uh, 3D, uh, um, in, um, data on one hand and then of course we do have the uh, the data of the green spots in downtown tokyo so by using these uh data sets uh which we uh, oh and also we do have uh what we call poteka and this is a sort of portable uh micro comet uh, measuring systems so by having all of these three uh three uh, major data sets uh, what we have developed is that uh, when you have this um, application, if you download this application to your smartphone, this smartphone will be telling you where you are and what will be the shortest route to reach to the green spot or the, the most comfortable uh, shaded route that you will be able to reach to the green spot from your, the place where you are now. So uh, these two images are sort of an example. If you want to have the shortest route, then this will be the way, but you will be exposed to the sunshine. But on the other hand, if you want to go through a shaded place, much more comfortable place, then this will be the way that you will be reaching to the uh, green spot. So we have been uh, developing this kind of application to guide people properly to the cool spots we value. And so once again, this application will be telling you that you're here and you're currently under the um, super hot condition like a 36 degrees Celsius. But here's a place where you can enjoy cooler air and um, this might be shorter, but if you go this way, it's gonna be much more comfortable because it's gonna be shaded. So that, well, that, that's a sort of idea uh, what uh, this uh, application will be telling you. So this will be another way which will be follow, um, supporting those um, new green spots in downtown Tokyo and properly guiding people toward those places. So it shows that, you know, why don't you go through this kind of place and then you will be reaching to these places. Yeah, so I think that's another way that you will be uh, properly providing cool spots to make the people feel, feel cooler even though that you were staying in downtown Tokyo. So that was the second approach that I have been talking about. But then there will be another way, the third way, which is more sort of a psychological story. Um, looking back the history of Tokyo, well, Tokyo was called Edo during the medieval years. And uh, Edo was a city um, huge city uh, already in the 18th century, which accommodated over 1 million people. And actually uh, back in 18th century, I'm pretty confident that Edo was the largest city in the world uh, because there were about 1 million people already. Uh, well, back in 18th century, London, Paris were something one third or half size of Tokyo. Uh, and uh, I think it was the same story for Shanghai as well. Um, but anyway, um, you know, Tokyo was the largest city in the world. But at the same time, Tokyo was super crowded. Uh, as you can see here, the population density of citizens' neighborhood 
used to be about uh, five times higher than the population density today in downtown Tokyo, even though uh, the old houses were flat. So people were living in a tiny, tiny neighborhood, you know, close to uh, each other. So that was the reality. But even though that people were living in those tiny spots, and of course, you know, uh, um, once you live in that kind of a super crowded uh, situation, uh, I can easily imagine that it was so hot during summertime, but people were trying to make them feel cooler by having greens in, the, in their houses and then in their neighborhoods. And uh, these two festivals, uh, one is a festival of uh, Chinese lantern fruit, which is called Hozuki in Japanese. Uh, <coughs> even today, uh, we do have this festival um, every July and at one of the temples in downtown Tokyo. But the, this has been continuing since the Edo time. So that has been around for a couple hundred years already. But this was one of the ways how people were making them feel cooler by hanging these um, uh, plants in, in their house or maybe uh, in their neighborhood. And the same story for Morning Glory as well. Uh, we do have another festival in downtown Tokyo. Um, so that has been around for a couple hundred years already. And that was another way how people have been enjoying um, greens to make them feel cooler. And if you go to one of the uh, downtown areas in, in, uh, in Tokyo, well, still some, uh, sometimes you'll be finding some of the kind of situation. Uh, this area is quite close to our campus, our university campus. Uh, but actually, uh, this area was not bombed during the Second World War, so that uh, it has been somehow maintaining the very old neighborhood of Tokyo. And once you go into this neighborhood, uh, well, first, when you see from the uh, Google images, well, you might see that there is no green here. You know, it's only houses and houses, and you don't, you might not think that there will be any green. But once you are in this neighborhood, well, this is what you find. Um, there are so many tiny greens surrounding tiny houses, um, which once again makes you feel cooler, even though that the actual temperature is not that low. So that uh, this will be another way that you can think of when you're trying to make people, make people feel cooler, even though that temp, uh, you won't be able to reduce the temperature. So once again, uh, as I show at the beginning of my presentation, yes, cities in the world uh, must mitigate or adapt to the climate change. And to think, but on, uh, once again, on the other hand, uh, we are we'll be having many many cities in the world uh, growing, uh, still growing in the future. And as we know, at the end of the twenty first century, about uh, sixty to seventy percent of the total population of the world will be living in the cities. So that constantly, uh, even though that a city must mitigate or adapt to the ground, uh, the uh, heat. But, but still the cities will uh, continue growing in the future. And uh, if the city grows, of course, um, yes, we'll be having more and more heat island effect. Um, here I have the one example of Tokyo. And of course, you know, Tokyo used to be much smaller in the past, but now the Tokyo has been expanding and expanding. So constantly the heat island became to be larger and larger because we have been losing greens surrounding Tokyo. And uh, this shows how the green has been decreasing. Uh, in the, so back in 1978, uh, these places, A, B, C, D, E, in the suburbs of Tokyo, well, A is in the mountains, so you don't hit, see any date changes in between 1978 and, 99, and 1998. But when it comes to places like B, C, D, E, I hope you can easily realize that how green has been decreasing in the, in the suburbs of Tokyo. Uh, in terms of B area, you have a significant decrease of a crop fields. In terms of a C area, you have a significant decrease of a crop fields and also rice paddies. And D, rice paddies, E, crop fields. You know, as you can see, mostly those agricultural lands are gone. And what happened in terms of air temperature was that uh, when it comes to A area, because it's in the deep mountains, you don't see so much changes in the temperature of the area. But when it comes to B, C, D, E, you see that um, the temperature gap between the center part 
f and these places are coming to be smaller and smaller, which mean other words, which mean that the BCDE, the temperature is rising and it's coming to be more and more near to the temperature of the midtown F. And so this is one of those examples how the heat island of Tokyo is becoming to be larger and larger. So if that is a case for not only for Tokyo, but for many cities in the world, what we seriously have to think of is, um, of course, you know, we do have to mitigate, but at the same time, we have to think of adaptation. And when you talk about ad adapting to the heat, I would say, roughly speaking, there will be two different ways that you can adapt to the heat, which are these two. And if you want to take these two, uh, what you can do is on one hand, set regulations to enhance joint ventures by public and private sectors to increase privately owned but used for um, public green open spaces, which I have been talking about, and then uh, probably um, guide people to those places by using, for example, those uh, applications which we are now trying to develop. And then if you want to make people feel fit, uh, psychologically cooler, well, that's a sort of a uh, a story to regenerate traditional and also vernacular knowledges to let them fit into the lifestyles and work science today. So in, uh, as my final um, message, you know, the develop modern regulations and technologies by regenerating traditional and vernacular knowledges will be the key. So that's my story. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And I hope that we still have over 20 minutes for discussion. But anyway, uh, thank you so much for uh, your uh, kind attention. Thank you.